A mystical wanderer. Dark desert highways. A ragged prince who turns into a toad. The beast of fame that cannot be killed. Recognize these images? Yep, it's Carol King's famous song, Tapestry, a riddling allegory that questions more than it answers, and Hotel California by the Eagles, another allegory of fame and the goddess Fortuna. Hotel California has a classical music connection to Carl Orff's O oh, Fortuna. Now there's a surprise. These chart-topping hit songs are the focus for Allegories Part 2. Come along as we explore the songs and their allegories and discover how to craft an allegory in our own writing. Welcome to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Runes, all from Writers, Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, grab a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. We've entered spring. Let's have a check-in. All three contributors to The Right Focus have publications this spring. Remy Black just published The Ribbon Gate, second novella in her fantasy trilogy, Spells of Earth. M.A. Lee just released The Dark Lord, a novella that combines the gothic with mystery set in Regency England. Eddie Runes collaborated with M. on the short story Todd the Fox and the Fairies in the Ring, first in the Wild Sherwood series. Next up, Remy will write the third novella to finish Spells of Earth, M is after another gothic-touched novella, and she and Edie will collaborate on another short story for the Wild Sherwood series. Now that we've checked in, let's go on to today's episode, Allegories, Part 2. Tapestry is one of those haunting stories to which we return over and over again. Sometimes we're enticed to return by that riddling mystery that surrounds the work. We long to decipher the maze of words. Sometimes it's the beauty of the words, or the music, or both. And sometimes our enticement is the emotion and memories that the song or poem evokes. Links to the lyrics and perhaps a video on YouTube will be in the show notes. The obvious story in Tapestry is a new version of the old fairy tale. A tapestry itself is a picture stitched with different colored threads. The canvas upon which it is built is blank. The needleworking artist creates an image as she stitches. If the threads are pulled out or unraveled, the created image is lost. Carol King's allegory begins by stating the metaphor, life equals a tapestry. Then elements of the comparison are revealed. As King works through her allegory, the various elements of the story create the points, each as interconnected as the threads in a tapestry. In the song, King does not bother with the usual refrain or chorus. Each stanza serves a distinct purpose. The first builds the allegory. The second and third and fourth stanzas work out the story. The last connects the story to herself and us and concludes the allegory. To help tie her lines together, she uses alliteration. In the first stanza, rich and royal, vision and view, wondrous, woven, bits and blue. Second stanza, soft, silver, sadness and sky, torn and tattered, coat and colors. In the third stanza, what and where, hanging and hand. Fourth, rutted road, river rock, turned toad, Seems someone spelled. Fifth stanza, gray, ghostly, deepest darkness, and dressed. The story of the allegory ties the poem together, yet King also rhymes each stanza with a simple paired couplet. The rhyme scheme is the simplest of all, A-A-B-B. The concluding fifth stanza has five lines instead of four with a neat echo because the very last line is a repeat of the last part of the line before. And in the song itself, King concludes with piano repetition of the last stanza, unvocalized. So, a very seemingly simple structure for her allegory. However, King is extremely clever with the elements of her story. 
Like the moon spinners of Greek mythology, the speaker in tapestry is weaving different threads together to create an image of her life. The Greek fate Clotho spins the thread. Her sister Lachesis measures it. The third sister, Atropo, cuts the length with her dreaded shears. According to King, my life has been a tapestry. We are our own fates. We select the colors for our lives of rich and royal hue. In the paradox of the antithetical repetition, everlasting and ever-changing, we construct meaning through opposing constancy and change. Our lives push steadily onward, even as they alter visibly and invisibly. When we end, our souls continue to a new existence. This is the magic, the miracles that we don't recognize. The last line contains a seeming paradox, a tapestry to feel and see, impossible to hold. If we can feel it, how can we not hold it in our hands? Ah, feel has a dual meaning, touch and emotion. King starts her mysterious riddling in the second stanza. The allegorical story begins there, with the entrance of the tattered domain drifter, each bit and piece symbolic of his wanderings. He wears a coat of many colors, like the biblical Joseph, forced to leave his homeland because his brothers sold him into slavery. Joseph had to make the best of his situation, just as we should when we sell ourselves into the slavery of work. Joseph interpreted the Pharaoh's dream, just as we must interpret our own dreams, our own goals, and turn them into reality. This drifter moved with some uncertainty. That's like us again. We go for years without understanding our purpose. I'm certain the biblical Joseph had many years when he wondered why he was where he was. In pursuit of something, we reach for a golden item, unnamed, unclassified. We desire it. We think it's the ultimate treasure. Like Adam and Eve, we eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the poem, though, the drifter's hand grasps nothing. He reaches for his treasure, reaches for the knowledge of his desire. He hasn't found it yet, like the fairy tale of the enchanted songbird in a gilded cage in a tree. We desire songs of love, but how often do we find such love? King merely hints at this allusion to the enchanted songbird, yet it fits best with her other wide-ranging allusions. The fourth stanza reveals, even as it veils, on the rutted road of his journey, the drifter takes his ease on a river rock only to fall victim to a curse. He becomes the frog prince of the fairy tale, transformed by a wicked spell. We also are transformed when our desires are thwarted again and again, dreams deferred, as in Langston Hughes's poem Harlem. Yet who created this wicked spell? Why is the drifter cursed? Would anyone have triggered the curse? Or was the spell intended for him alone? The accursed drifter, now frog, needs his princess. Only she can kiss him and remove the curse. He'll be trapped in his toadiest form until he receives that kiss from someone both inherently great and innately kind. The fifth stanza continues the riddling even as it concludes it. An unknown figure enters the tapestry. The speaker recognizes this person as a companion, even as she questions who he is. Is he the reaper? Is he death? as in Donald Justice incidents in a rose garden. Before she can discover, the tapestry and life unravel. The moon spinner's thread is done. The moon spinners who provide the threads to weave the tapestry are from great myth. Joseph is biblical, while the golden treasure in the tree could be the enchanted songbird story from China. The frog prince is a European fairy tale, and death, gray and ghostly, sometimes dressed in deepest black, comes from the mythologies of many cultures. What is this journey to find the greatest treasure of all? What is this journey that exhausts us? When we stop briefly to rest, are we falling into the wicked spell of non-pursuit? Is the drifter Perseus bringing back a gorgon's head? Is the songbird the golden nightingale that heals the dying emperor? Or is it the golden bird sought by the young prince who constantly makes mistakes and needs the fox's avuncular help? Like the best of the ancient balladeers, King doesn't give us any of the answers. Deliberately, she does not. These questions keep us returning to decipher the clues she has given us. Her allegory draws from everywhere and every when and every what, just as we do. We don't have all the answers. We keep returning to our own story to decipher the clues we are given, clues we may never decipher.
That's our first sample allegory from the 1970s. Our second has an odd, strange beginning, which is O Fortuna by Carl Orff from the classics. And the allegory is Hotel California by the Eagles. The persona in Hotel California seems to relate a surreal visit to a roadside hotel that turns ugly before it imprisons him. However, through allegory, the song is the pursuit for fame and fortune. These cost more than the persona anticipated and never wished to pay. Again, links for the lyrics and the video will be in the show notes, and you probably should have the lyrics in front of you. The lady who draws the persona to the Hotel California is Lady Fortuna, a goddess who rules over fame and fortune, luck and fate. Carl Orff is a rather uneasy German composer seeking Fortuna with her sacrificial demands. He does not consider this goddess benevolent, nor does the songwriter of the Hotel California. In Orff, Lady Fortuna's world is lit by the moon, changeable in its monthly course. Statu variabilis semper crassis ot de crassis. In our pursuit of her, we must enter her realm. She will oppress us long before she soothes us. She takes her whip of servitude to our naked backs and punishes us before she rewards us. When Fortuna grants what we have sought, we discover the additional monstrous price we must pay, and we also discover that fame and fortune are empty achievements, material but not wonderful, a monkey's paw of evil wrapped around good. As Orff writes, life becomes in minus et inanus. And please forgive my Latin pronunciation. Let's play 20 questions with Hotel California. The first stanza of chorus introduces the pursuit of time on that dark desert highway. People in pursuit of their dreams believe that their lives are deserts that they must drive through before they find where they want to be. We need three words in the first stanza that represent the persona's blindness about where he is heading in his pursuit of fame. Well, the best picks are dark, dim, distance, night, and colitis. What does the shimmering light represent? The lights from an arcade promoting a performance. The shimmering would be the action of the neon in the lights. Then the song says, she lit up a candle and she showed me the way. She is Lady Fortuna. Why is she so attractive to people pursuing their dreams? Well, People believe that once they're rich and famous, they will have no worries. Sad to say, that's not true. The mission bell tolls a warning. Where does the persona admit to hearing that warning but ignores it? This could be heaven or hell, which is a paradox. How does the famous California city that lures people seeking fame and fortune always have plenty of room? Well, people keep coming, expecting to succeed, only to fail and leave making room for more seekers to come in. With stanza two, we have Her mind is Tiffany twisted. She got the Mercedes Benz. She got a lot of pretty, pretty boys she calls friends. The dance in the courtyard, sweet summer sweat. Some dance to remember, some dance to forget. Tiffany, of course, is a reference to the famous jewelry store. Mercedes Benz is the best engineered, mass-produced vehicle on the roads. But the Mercedes Benz is not spelled like the car. It's spelled B-E-N-D-S. So what is the purpose of the Benz? That could be a reference to driving on a crooked road. It makes me think of that old song, Dead Man's Curve. But the persona has started out on a dark desert highway, and the pursuit of fame and fortune requires some bendy actions that we might abhor in daylight. Or it could be the Benz, decompression sickness, when deep divers come too quickly to the surface. Rising fame could be making the persona sick as he considers everything he's giving up and every one he's hurting. It'll be easier to stick with the highway. We know through these two brand references that the persona is achieving success, enough that he can waste money. Material possessions are a waste. They temporarily feed our greed and gluttony. They do not help the persona or others. Without giving to others, the persona will never feel satisfied and will always seek more and more to fill his emptiness. That's classic Platonism, attempting to balance the mind, the body, and the soul through equally fulfilling events. 
the line, some dance to remember, some dance to forget, assuming that dance is related to performing a job that is winning fame and fortune, is the treadmill that the persona is on. The beauty of the work he loves keeps him still performing, but the grind of the work wears him down. The joy of his work has left. The next stanza says, I called up the captain, please bring me my wine. And he said, we haven't had that spirit here since 1969. The wine represents the sweetness of the dream still before the persona. The chorus says, welcome to the Hotel California. Such a lovely place, such a lovely face. They living it up at the Hotel California. What a nice surprise. Bring your alibis. Alibis are only necessary when criminal activity has occurred and penalties will be adjudicated. Has Fortuna led the persona into evil misbehavior? Obviously. Mirrors on the ceiling, pink champagne on ice, prisoners of our own device. And the master's chamber, they gathered for the feast. They stab it with their stilly knives, but they just can't kill the beast. Lady Fortuna tells them that their prisoners are, as Orf says, sor salutis and semper in inguaria. Fate is against me, and I am always enslaved to her, which is a devastating realization. The beast is the juggernaut of the now rolling success. The master is what controls the success. Who is the master? The audience. Musicians are controlled because they must keep producing the same things that brought the original success. For painters and writers and performers, they're also trapped. Their creativity cast aside so that their work can continue to keep the audience happy. If they do not produce what the audience wants, with just a tiny bit of change to seem new, the fickle audience will abandon them. So who has those stilly knives to kill the beast? It's not the audience. It's the trapped performers. They have come to hate the juggernaut wheel, grinding them down and down. Final stanza says, Last thing I remember, running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax, said the nightman. We are programmed to receive. You can check out any time you like. But you can never leave. The persona is running for the door because he can no longer accept everything he has sacrificed, all the pain and evil he has endured. He wants to return to the time before fame and fortune. But, as the nightman says, you can receive fame, but once it's grabbed you, you can't take it away. Success can never be abandoned. Lady Fortuna's hotel accepts people in. A small funnel that can endure the pain laps up the evil in a blind acquiescence to the dream and willingly abandons everything good about the dream in order to achieve wealth and fame. The only way to check out of Lady Fortuna's hotel is death. Most people, with their imp of the perverse, as Edgar Allan Poe calls it, get focused on the Kalitas and the lady and the wine and the beast and go no further into the allegory. Understanding the darker elements of Hotel California doesn't destroy my enjoyment of the song. I just have to turn off my intellect and dance around to the guitars. Hotel California is not a happy place to visit, and you don't get to leave. In my own blindness on dark desert highways, I have often wanted fame and fortune for myself. That's a mistake. Orf and the Eagles knew that. We've looked rather deeply into allegories from the past and the present. And our visit to the interpretive realm of enhancements is finally done. Symbols of numbers and colors, strong imagery, archetypes and illusions, and now allegory. In our next episode, we begin structural sentence craft with the world of the inverted. That sounds a little twisted, doesn't it? Part of inversion is yoga speak. Enjoy inversions we do. I think it's time for James Baldwin to give us some inspiration. Very simply, he said, all art is a kind of a confession. With allegory, we may think we hide our submerged story, but up it comes with its periscope to look around and give everyone hints. Thanks for listening to The Rock Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by Emma Lee from Writers Inc. Books, assisted by Remy Black and Edie Runes. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. 
Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at linkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps, and you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, right on.